coming to you live from WTHI Delsey Studios in sunny Los Angeles, California. The Hush Hush Society presents Declassified Discussions with Slick Frank Sanders and the Molly Wop Band. Featuring a special guest. And here's your hosts, Mystery Mike and Declassified Dave. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today for a very exciting installment of the Declassified Discussions. Today we have a researcher, writer, and editor of The Heretic magazine and is known for his work as a television presenter on historical documentaries. He has worked on the travel channels The Alaska Triangle, Forbidden History, and as well as Ancient Top Ten on Discovery Channel and Science Channel's What on Earth, and most recently, Conspiracies Decoded, and the curse of the Highgate vampire. We are very excited to introduce Mr. Andrew Goff. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. Andrew, please tell us first and foremost what you have going on right now in your world. Yeah, you know, it's 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 really picking up. Uh, last week, I filmed um, actually a very, very grueling two days of uh, filming for a new show called In the Shadows, really detailed look on secret societies, not just this 30,000 foot glossy kind of Freemasons are bad sort of thing. It goes into minute detail on all sorts of unusual elements of secret society. So so that's kind of cool. I have another, uh, actually uh, a paranormal focused documentary on alien abductees. And my contribution to that is to talk about... Uh, portals Ooh. so uh that's coming up next week and uh yeah so it's it, it's all quite busy now which is nice that's awesome very interesting you mentioned portals and aliens and that kind of draws back to something that we've talked about with many of our guests actually and talked about with cryptids and uaps in general do you think you know based off of what you've done with the show so far do you think that uaps or maybe even cryptids do you think that they are using portals in many different places or is that their main way of travel? Is that how they're they're breaking time and space? Yeah, I mean, it, it's such an inter interesting question. Uh, another uh, Discovery Channel documentary is all about kind of these portal places. That's coming up in the next uh, few weeks. And, you know, she has Skinwalker Ranch, right? Oh, yeah. I think it's really interesting. One of the things that I did, gosh, a couple of years ago, and we're just, just finishing now, is I had this idea for uh, a show called Mystic Britain. And everyone said, no, that's a horrible idea. You don't understand. Nobody in the U.S. is going to care about mysteries in the U.K. No, Andy, that's not how it works. Oh, okay, fine. I went to everybody. And now Smithsonian comes out with Mysterious Britain. <laughs> really? <laughs> but what the pilot for that was the werewolves of Canuck Chase. And Canuck Chase is like this big nature reserve in the English Midlands, south of Birmingham. And yeah, there's lots, <laughs> lots of interesting things about werewolves. And I interviewed so many people. I would stand in the middle of the heath and people would walk by and I would say, excuse me, I'm just wondering, have, have you ever had, I know what you're going to ask me, you're going to ask me about werewolves. I'm like, well, no, have you had any interesting experiences living around here? And they, they'd all be like, no, no, of course well, there was that one time. They would tell you this story and your jaw would just drop. Like, are you kidding me? That's unbelievable. That should be, in a, that should be a book, just that one story. Mm. So Kenneth Chase has got pig head men, UFO sightings, gray ladies with no uh, genitalia, black eyed children. So yeah, there are these hot spots. There's one in Kentucky. They're making a show about um, black water or something or other in Kentucky. Another one of these paranormal hot spots where all kinds of strange stuff is going on. Yeah, there was also Hellier. I think Hellier was uh, around Kentucky. And they were talking about the mammoth caves over there as being maybe portal entrances for whatever creature they were looking at in Hellier. But I think one thing that we tend to do is kind of think locally when we think about these phenomenon. We, you know, especially if we're based out of America, we go, oh, well, you know, let's only look at America. It is a worldwide phenomenon and it happens actually a lot more in other places other than the United States. So it's interesting that they would kind of write that off and say, no, people wouldn't be 
be interested in that. Yeah, well, we're we're going to finally finish the um, the pilot, and the producer and I are still arguing about, <laughs> about it. He wants it to be about werewolves, and I want it to be about. Well, we started out looking for werewolves. We ended up with this discovery that the place is full of all sorts of paranormal things. In fact, one of the best pieces was. It's a full moon, midsummer, midnight. We're out in the German cemetery, which is where all the werewolf sightings occur. And I can hear some uh, some howling. And uh, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. We're going to get it live. We're gonna, this is going to be a, a Bigfoot footage. You know, live on camera. Come with me, guys. Come on. Here we go. And I'm talking in the camera. And the howling and uh, the moaning is is really like... Uh, there's no mistaking it. And I'm like, it's coming from those trees. Actually, it looks like there's a, maybe, what is that, a parking lot? I don't know. Let's, let's keep going over there. So we go over there and I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. It was and is this Canic Chase Forest Preserve, Natural Reserve area, the world's capital for dogging. Oh. If you're like me, you're like, well, what's dogging? Dogging is the practice of not only having sex in public, but sharing your partner in a parking lot with other people. Um, oh. <laughs> well, dogging, and I think it's just so intro. It was hysterical because it sounded like a werewolf, I'm telling you. Um, and, and we have it all on camera. The look at my face like, oh, shit. And next, guy, sorry, I thought it was a werewolf. Um, but the fact that that's also there just tells you that you know, what kind of energies are going on? And everyone's always looking to the sky for the answers. I think you have to look below your feet for the answers. Is that little experience going to make the final cut into the show, though? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, yes. the, the producer just loves it. I'm like, yeah, it's got to be like the trailer. It's so good. <laughs> we're just, we just fall about uh, laughing because it's it's so it's all on camera. So I, I I think there's these places all over the um, the globe. Absolutely, um, Discovery Channel was quizzing me on them. I had an interview with them two Sundays ago. They're like, "Well, do you know about the one in New Jersey? And there's one in Japan." But you don't know about that. Oh, well, there's one in. I'm like, oh, come on, they're everywhere. Andrew, we just want to get a little bit of insight into your background and what really kickstarted your career into investigating and researching all of these interesting and fascinating mysteries. I've always been passionate about ancient mysteries, and I was pretty well traveled. Uh, you know, I'd been to India and uh, South America and all those places before I came to the UK in '97. And I met some cool people in the UK. I remember uh, going with my, my then girlfriend to uh, uh, this like, quaint little English village for the day out. And we were driving down this country lane. And I'm like, what the hell is that? That's a pyramid. Look, at there's a pyramid. What's a pyramid doing in England? And it's Silbury Hill. And so you, you get really into the megalithic culture. And, you know, it's, it's something that you have in the States, of course, but you don't have as much of it so close to you. And to make a long story short... I got involved with a lot of people who had similar interests, and, and one of those was writing a book, the very first book on Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown Companion, and uh, they asked me to write the section on what was the inspiration for the story. Well, it's a story of Rennes Chateau and the priest, 1891, uh, south of France. He discovers scrolls uh, in a pillar when he's renovating his church. So I, I write like 40% of the book on that story. But just to wind him up, I write myself into the story as the guy who figures out the mystery. And it was just a piss take. Um, I was having a laugh, but the editors, um, and the book went on to sell millions of copies, right? The editors loved it. They said, no, we're keeping it in. I'm like, oh, uh, they're like, but you, you're a nobody. You need a website. Website, what would I do? So I create a website. Then I'm embarrassed because there's no content. So, so I just start writing stuff uh, and I wrote that uh, King Arthur could very well have been an archetype. He never existed. You know, there's 12 knights of the round table and, you know, he's destined to return and all this kind of stuff. And, and then National Geographic calls and says, we saw your blog and we'd like you to uh, um, appear in uh, the truth behind King Arthur for 
um, National Geographic channel. And then once people kind of see you in one show, they ask you to be in another show. So it's just kind of a, you know, a bit of luck really, or misfortune, however you want to put it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So this will seem kind of like a big question, but what do you think in your mind, in your honest opinion, is the biggest ancient mystery in the world? God, you know, the, the answer to that would vary depending upon when you've asked me. And if you asked me a few years ago, you know, maybe I would have said, oh, I think Atlantis is in Morocco. And I do think it, it could very well be in Morocco. But, you know, what is the Holy Grail? Or, you know, um, is the Ark of the Covenant real? Or was it a propaganda fake news story just to intimidate uh, potentially opposing uh, armies and forces who want to attack you, but won't now because you have the instrument of God on your side. So right now, I am wondering about the constitution of the earth and the firmament. Um, you know, those little, those little kind of egg shaped things that have like a, a clear dome on them and you shake them and snow falls. Oh, like a snow globe. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the earth is that. And the firmament is the waterly abyss, which goes on top of us. So I write a lot uh, and lecture a lot about the inner earth from Haley to Euler, all these great scientists have said the earth has many levels inside and is probably inhabited. And there's lots of you know discussion on that. We all are familiar with the inner earth and Aragatha and all that kind of stuff. I think we are in the inner earth. We're not on the outside. And the out, because we had the firmament above us, there's guys with three or four PhDs who are saying, you can't leave. And there is uh, declassified documents that were supposed to be declassified for for this reason, but as you read them, they actually talk about the, the missions to photograph the firmament. You look at the goddess Newt in, in uh, Egyptology, and, and she's the goddess of the sky, and she's sort of bent over and, and far-reaching, you know, curve. You know, why are rainbows shaped the way they're shaped? Why do all rockets that go up by NASA, by the way, NASA lies 100% of the time, about 100% of everything lies, lies, lies. These rockets go up and you see like all this water. What? It is water. They've hit the firmament. You can't leave. Hmm. So it's kind of a mixture of an inner earth and flat earth model, really. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know what the answer is. I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with it because I don't really think we're flat. Although I do think, look at the map the UN uses for you know planet Earth. You see this great Arctic wall. You see this wall going around the continents that we know. But beyond that are other continents. Come on. You, you, there's many examples of this image of all the continents enclosed. I mean, think about it. You've got every country hates every other country and disagrees and bickers about everything. Trade and Brexit. But they all agree you can't go anywhere near Antarctica. No, no, we all agree on that. It's, uh, well, I mean, that's where one of the entrances to what's beyond that Arctic wall actually is. So if we go beyond that, do we find the true Atlantis and uh, Mura and all these, you know, places of mythology that were supposedly just legend, not fact? I think, and, and then you've got this whole Tartarian empire thing going on, which is so interesting. And this notion that what we think are mountains were really trees. And you, you begin to wonder with that shape of a, what did you call it? The thing you shake in the snow? Oh, the snow globe. Yep. Snow globe. Are we living in a, uh, a greenhouse? Are we living in, you know, a greenhouse? And we don't know it. That's interesting. Never thought about that, of us being in the inner part of the proposed inner earth. Charles Teed, uh, I think it was Charles, definitely Teed, but I think it's Charles Teed, you know, proposed um, that we're, we're not on the outside. And I've spoken to some people, I mean, some really um, connected people uh, who told me Notre Dame was going to burn, for instance. You know you're connected when, you know, Notre Dame is going to burn. And they agree, no, we're not on the outside. We're on the inside. So that begs the question well we you know we've seen all the images from nasa and you know uh, the earth is round and i'm not saying it isn't round uh i'm not saying it's flat i think there's multiple levels on the inside and i think that maybe where our continents are on this globe might be flat ish because the globe is that Big, but beyond that Arctic wall, there's other continents. Again, listeners should look at the uh, the logo for the United Nations and, and and their map. 
it clearly shows that. And many other places show that as well. I'm presenting at the Chariots of uh, the Gods conference in the UK this June with uh, Eric Von Donenkin and Giorgio. Um, That's going to be awesome. And they won't let me talk about uh, the inner earth. Really? Why is that? Oh, come on. I mean, <laughs> just challenging everything that's ever been on Ancient Alien. Because it's covered too much. Mm. Um, it will be live streamed on, on Gaia. Um, so I've been thinking about talking about the firmament. Uh, and they're like, no, no, no. We don't want you to embarrass yourself by talking about the flat earth. I'm like, come on. So I don't know what to think uh, about that. I, I'm, I'm trying to get my colleague who I'm doing a archaeological excavation with for Knights Templar relics here in England to uh, to let me talk about that, but um, that's only because I'm I'm really enthusiastic about it. But I'm sure he'll convince me it's it's not a, it's not a good idea, <laughs> at least not until um, the next uh, excavation, which is um, it looks like April. So, in your opinion, NASA total sham, no moon landings, no real space program. The big question is though, what would change on our planet if we found out if the Earth was flat or hollow? What what do you think would change? Well, I, I just can't believe NASA's gotten away with it. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous. Why do the astronauts have stars in the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Los Angeles? I don't know. Ask Stanley Kubrick. He'll tell you. Um, he filmed the whole thing. So you go, you go to the moon in 69 and you, you never go back? Really? The whole thing is a shambles. And if you look at redacted images of the poles, very, very interesting. Um, whether it's ESA, NASA, or Russian Mir. Uh, station, they all show big gaping holes at the poles. Scientists who were, were real scientists and not, you know, the products of pharmaceutical companies used to tell us that the Aurora Borealis came out of uh, those holes at the poles. Why does the image that NASA shows us of Saturn show that it just looks like another planet except for the pole has a hexagon on it? Um, something about the poles they're hiding from us. And I think that's one of the places. And, you know, Bird talks about it in his diary, uh, the Smoky God book, the Norwegian sailors who get lost and end up in the inner earth. Yeah, everyone talks about the fact that it's a really gradual transition. You're in a plane, you're in the Arctic. Oh, what? why is there a green valley below? Why is there a mammoth down there? You know, then before you know it, you see a crystalline city and, you know, there you go. So what would change is the realization that Earth is 4.5 billion years old. We're not its first civilized inhabitants, and we're probably not anywhere near as sophisticated as those who have come before us. That's an interesting take on it, for sure. We've done episodes on almost every one of these subjects. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Hollow Earth was a good one for us. We really enjoyed doing that one. Yeah. And I think we all kind of came to the conclusion that it's a viable thought process. It's possible, very possible to have an inner Earth and at least have some sort of uh, void underneath the mantle of what we stand upon. Yeah, I, you know, I did a, a What on Earth episode on the, the Russian Kola borehole. It goes down 20, 20 miles or kilometers, I forget. That's a, mm -hmm. it's a long ways into the earth. And they find fossils, fossils. And in 2014, it was discovered there's more bodies of water in terms of oceans beneath uh, the earth's crust than there is above it. And then you get into the whole, you know, I know it's, it's you're just walking into a wave of ridicule when you talk about this, but we're spinning at what, a thousand miles an hour and the earth is moving but that's how fast we're spinning and forget how fast the earth is moving. Um, but you have oceans which are on a round spear and, you know, try taking a baseball and pouring water over it in the faucet. It doesn't exactly stick to the baseball. I mean, I know we have gravity, but we've been lied to about everything, everything. Uh, there's been multiple resets, uh, you know, to hide the lies. I'm fascinated by this mud flood theory in the Tartarian Empire. Really don't know what to make of it. It's It looks, you know, very alluring that, yeah, there have been other great resets. They write books about them and they talk about the goals and objectives of the New World Order. And then it happens and people are like, oh, no, it's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they, they told us. <laughs> Can you expand on the, the mud flood? Uh, we've never heard of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so many buildings around the, the world. And San Francisco is a really good example because there's a lot of photographs of it. Washington, D.C., uh, the White House. Uh, that have huge elements 
of the actual building below ground with doors and windows and stairs all below ground. And there's photos of a lot of places from 100 years ago or so that show just mud everywhere. Mud, like there was a, a great landslide of mud around the world that covered up. And, and if you look at the, the, the White House and what's below it, there's like a whole strata of a building with windows and stairs and doors that's beneath ground. And there's many, and we've all, we all walk past old buildings uh, and we look at them and we're like, oh, that's a, that's a window down there. That's in, it's half covered. Huh, that's weird. Why would they do that? And you never really think about it. So this notion that there was a great reset and of, of whatever kind, and we kind of started over. Um, and these buildings that we thought were built in the 19th, 18th, 17th century were actually built far earlier by the Tartarian Empire who could harvest free energy. And you know, I look at images of Chicago, where I'm from, or Glasgow, which is a horrible place now. I love Scotland. I love Glasgow. But you look at the pictures of it from 80, 90, 100 years ago, and you're like, oh, my God, look at the architecture. Look, at it's just boggles your mind. One, how could you have done it? Your horse and carriage, and you have this amazing architecture. But it's gone now. Don't want you to know about that. A few minutes ago, you mentioned what on earth. In what on earth, there were so many mysteries and mysterious things caught by satellite imagery. From those things, what were some of the most intriguing if you haven't mentioned it already. Well, gosh, a lot of them are explainable. Some of them aren't. Um, I think it's a really interesting show and I'm trying to think there's uh, really anomalous images of like humans that you can see from aerial view, but they're actually mountains uh, and they take the form of like uh, people and, you know, really, really interesting stuff. It's funny that one of the um, What on Earth episodes used a satellite that I have recently commissioned, um, which I shouldn't say because you can't really commission these things without knowing somebody mm. and having access to, because uh, these, these are the same satellites they use to find you know, deep underground military bases in China. And I hired one during lockdown when, when people were a little bit desperate. <laughs> Um, to point it at this village in England where some old school techniques helped us identify where the Knights Templar had buried one of their really, really major hordes. And what the satellite guy said, which was really interesting, is something that one of the episodes on One on Earth spoke about, is that these sites, these ancient sites are protected. They're protected spiritually uh, with magic. And I know that sounds woo-woo and it sounds like it's kind of nuts, but the satellite guys, and I've since used two of them, two different companies, they say when they point, you know, because they've got spare time on their hands, right? They've got the world's most powerful underground satellite. You're not only going to use it when someone tells you, go do this. Mm -hmm. You use it all the time. You're, you're messing around with it, right? So you're pointing it at places and all the servers explode and, and all the infrastructure literally burns when you point it at an ancient site because there is protection. They're imbued with, with, with magic and spells and hexes so they're not seen or found. Hmm. And we've, we've experienced that in our excavation. And you know, I, I think it's, it's one of the things that Discovery Channel is trying to get me to do for this new documentary is to show one of the photos from this excavation. I'm not sure if I can do that, but it's, it's amazing the color it puts off. And, and even if you use just LiDAR, like they use in the Amazon uh, where it's really thick with brush and you want to find where there's archaeological sites underneath. The LIDAR will show interesting images that aren't there. It's just showing surface stuff, but it's showing stuff that isn't there when what's beneath it is protected. Hmm. And I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, Andrew, you have our email address if you ever feel like sharing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I did um, a two-hour documentary for Series 6, Episode 1 of Forbidden History on Yamashita's Gold and my good buddy Klaus Donner in the Philippines. And I've been there a few times. And wow, I mean, the Shinto priest they did not mess around. They, you know, they pillaged twelve Asian countries for a hundred years. Everything, every tomb robbing, every museum, every 
bank, every gold bar, everything from Korea to China to Malaysia, everything was taken and it's buried in the Philippines and it's really protected. I mean, the Shinto priests were, you know, they're, <laughs> they're kind of um, on the leading edge of, for lack of a better term, magic. And, and protection and the stories that the Klaus has shared, unbelievable, you know, workers have to quit working. You're down about 40 meters, you know, you're down 200 feet into the ground. And all of a sudden there's like an army of Japanese soldiers next to you and hmm. they're tapping you on the back. And, you know, so there's a lot of, a um, lot of protection, even in modern times that was, you know, not that long ago. Right. Um, but there seems to be a tradition of burying stuff and burying it really deep, really deep, and then putting um, some some hexes on it so that one, you can't see it, two, you're going to be prohibited from finding it. All right, Andrew. So I would like to switch gears a little bit. I know that our subjects are all over the place, but you have such a well-versed background in all of them. So as far as the Vatican, do you have any insights about some of the secrets that they're holding, maybe in their archives? Oh God, that's, that's another loaded one. <laughs> <laughs> I think they they've just renamed it, haven't they? Um I forget what it's called now. Um but it has a more academic name, but they still don't let you down there. I've done a a, a number of shows in in Rome and we thought we would have permission, but they always block us at the 11th hour. So I you know I think um if you look at the whistleblower or the 2001 or something priest who came forward saying that uh you know the Vatican has things like the Crowen visor which uh is an ancient device they didn't know what it was and they they got literally got rocket scientists and some other people to come and figure out that it was a uh, not a time travel device but you could look at any period in history, like you're you're watching a a video and 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 see what's you know what what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm I'm sure they've got loads and loads of amazing things. And does that include the Ark of the Covenant? You know, I I've argued and, and written because and I lived in Istanbul for a few years and still have a home there. That the Ark of the Covenant uh, is. Uh, hidden in plain sight in the top Kapi palace in the privy chamber in, in Istanbul. But yeah, the Vatican uh, undoubtedly has that an ama amazing documents. I think that they're going to have amazing documents that would turn um, theology on its head mm. if they were out. Yeah. Because it's all, you know, it, we've just been fed lie after lie after lie after lie. If it's a big enough lie about the miracles and the wine and and the resurrection, the, the lie is big enough, i.e. COVID, then people are going to believe it. Big lie, say it often, and it becomes fact. And that's NASA, and that's the Vatican. The big liars. Yeah. Big liars. I, I, I see those NASA shirts, and I'm a big New Order fan. I just saw New Order in concert again in, in London a couple months ago. And like the drummer has got this NASA shirt on. I'm like, it's a cool shirt, but I want a shirt that says NASA lies. That's what I want. <laughs> oh, you should check out our merchandise. Yeah, we might be able to make that happen. <laughs> oh, cool. One thing that's always fascinated the three of us, the talk of Nephilim or giants, do you think these beings were real? We're also being lied to about their existence, if they're still around or not. It's mentioned in texts that they're, you know, the offsprings of angels or some type of entity that came from the sky. Yeah, I... I, I totally believe in their existence. And if you look at the proper Hebrew translation, uh, it says to the effect of in those days, there were giants in the earth, mm. um, which is so interesting because all the, uh, so many of the accounts of the inner earth describe extremely tall in individuals with, ex you know, extremely gravity defined devices. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're looking up when we should be looking down. The answers to so many of the questions about UFOs and portals aren't in the sky, they're below our feet. And so, yeah, I, I think they exist today. Uh, you don't have to look back too far. There's photographs. Um, you know, a good, a good show would be Smithsonian lies. What is, what is the Smithsonian 
uh, brushed under the carpet. You know, Egyptian artifacts from the Grand Canyon, perhaps, or, you know, giants, uh, all sorts of stuff. I, I did a show for Forbidden History on the Giants of Sardinia, and there's farmers there, and I've met them, who are honest, ordinary folks who, who live in, um, they don't long for things they don't have. They're happy with their, their lovely little farm, and they're not lying when they say they unearth these great big um, giants, and they called the police, and the archaeologists came and took them away and assured them that they would get you know, remunerated in one form or another, but then Nothing. And and then you toss onto that all these clearly photoshopped images of giants and it becomes like flat earth. It becomes an area that uh, if you want your reputation intact, then, then you better not talk about giants. We'll have to dive into that very soon. Yeah, we've been putting it off. I forgot what show it was on, but there was an account of some soldiers within the last five years that supposedly got into a firefight with a giant. Yeah, in Afghanistan. Yeah, absolutely. And supposedly that's happened again just recently in recent weeks really um, Jeez. wow and the, the, the soldiers american soldiers have uh, ptsd uh, understandably from you know having to to deal with them it's really really weird and i don't know why my brain is is going here but um one of the things that i think is also really odd is with all the detail in the old testament and all the stories about the holy family's trip to cairo and uh, wars between pharaohs in Egypt. Why is there no mention of the pyramids? There's no mention of a single pyramid, all of which existed um, in biblical times. So as a cover up, I can't. I can't even think of an answer to that, because you know. And again, Old Testament talks about Moses going in Mount Sinai. My good buddy uh, Ralph Ellis argues that Mount Sinai is Khufu Pyramid of Giza, but there's lots of pyramids and they were all there. And in that day in particular, wouldn't that have just blown your mind? But there's no mention of them. Andrew, some of our hushlings, I'm sure, don't get the Yesterday channel that is broadcasted in the UK, where World War Weird was released. Now, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that were discussed about World War II and World War One in that program? Yeah, I've done a whole bunch of stuff on um, World War II in particular, and not only in World War, War Weird. I can't even say it. You know, the funny thing is, when you film these things... Um, the worst was World War Weird and Alaska Triangle because they both have you, um, World War Weird has you in the crypt of a church, absolutely freezing. And Alaska Triangle, they must want you to feel like you're in Alaska because you're in the basement of a factory in Cardiff, Wales with Everyone around you has got six parkas on and heaters all around them. And you have to sit there in a shirt. <laughs> and I caught like the worst. I never get sick. I'd, I was sick for months after series one of Alaska Triangle. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think it all comes back to um, a lot of the stories about the Nazis' obsession with their perceived Aryan heritage going back hundreds of thousands of years and their quest to to retrieve and leverage these power objects from the Spear of Destiny to the Bell to uh, the Holy Grail. And their, you know, their premier Grail hunter, who I think was, uh, is the prototype for Indiana Jones, uh, is Otto Rahn, who allegedly committed suicide on a ski slope. Really, hmm. but yeah, he he had free reign, and and he was uh, he could have gone anywhere to look for anything, and he went to the south of France in the Pyrenees and uh, was looking for the Holy Grail and um, wasn't going to leave until he found it. And by all accounts, he found it. So whether that's hidden underneath uh, the floors of Wevelsburg or the Vatican is tough to say, but there's so much that's been buried. It's fascinating. We need to unearth this stuff. But, but, but really the Nazi stuff. The Nazi stuff is what invariance on... Uh, the interplay between Himmler and Hitler, of course, but but others had in terms of who was the biggest occultist. There were many of them. In your opinion, how close do you think the Nazis were to the U.S. mainland in terms of a possible invasion during the war? Oh, gosh, I think um, 
It's a complicated uh, question and, and answer. I, you know, they always said uh, the greatest feat of Lucifer was was making people think the devil wasn't real, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe the greatest feat of uh, World War II was making people think that the Nazis didn't win. Um, you know, the Fourth Reich, you could argue, is the European Union. Merkel, some have argued, is Hitler's daughter. And, you, you know, we, Operation Paperclip, uh, you know, the U.S. just took all of those German scientists like it was just a normal thing to do. So, yeah, you know, did did Hitler survive? Did he go to Argentina? Did he go to the Arctic and into the inner earth? I mean, they, they've left maps for U-boats to go uh, navigate to the inner earth. There's letters all about it. Inner earth is going to hold the secrets that that really blow our mind, not outer space. It's the inner earth. And if you look at um, uh, people who have written the big books about it, I've, I've always had an initiate who has been there telling them things. And if you believe those things, they say the whole globe is like a checkerboard filled with these chambers from antiquity of going back hundreds of thousands of years of arts and sciences and technology that is preserved there for when we need it. And there'll be a time when we're decimated and the people from the inner earth will come forth and give us this knowledge to reboot our civilization. And that's a really common thread throughout a lot of these um, inner earth accounts. Sorry for going back to inner earth again. It's okay. It's actually, uh, it's close to a follow-up question that I had. You know, you talked about maybe Antarctica being the entrance to the inner earth or, you know, being a portal location. Do you think that the Nazis maybe set up those secret bases there and and that's what they did post-World War II? And maybe even it's possible that Hitler made his way to America. I mean, it, it would be the last place that anybody would expect to see Adolf Hitler walk down the street of New York or something, uh, uh, obviously sans mustache. But, you know, what do you think about the the possibility of these Nazi bases in Antarctica and, and the Nazis' obsession with Antarctica? Well, I, I think whether, whether there's smoke, there's fire. And, and, and they if they found these places and stayed, I mean, the key is they found them. They, they've been there for a very, very long time. And if they have found them and kind of acclimated there, then I find it difficult to believe that the Nazis could create uh, a headquarters uh, in the inner earth where they would operate (laughs) and pull strings on what's going on above the planet. I think there's rulers um, in these different locations, just like we have continents above India and Africa, America. There's the same sort of things uh, beneath the earth. There's Aragatha is the biggie, but in England, it's St. Martin's land. There is a detailed account of two green children who came up uh, just around Cambridge in the 12th century. And the blogger of the day, uh, William of Newburgh, has a really explicit account of the uh, the boy and the girl. Their skin is green. They don't speak English. They don't eat food. They're dressed funny. The boy dies from malnutrition. The girl learns English eventually and recounts the story of St. Martin's land, where the sun is always like dusk and dawn. But beyond, there's another sun where it's is more brightly shining on another continent uh, under the earth. So, yeah, I, I, I think the Nazis couldn't have established, you know, sort of their own Munich under the ground. They would have had to have uh, acquiesced to those who were already there, I think. Although Bert, Bird in his diary, uh, if we can believe his diary, talks about, oh yeah, there's the green pasture. Oh, there's the mammoth. You know, he's flying uh, now five hours into his flight from Antarctica. And all of a sudden he sees planes with swastikas on them who have uh, somehow taken over the controls of his plane, guiding him to the ground. Yeah, be a scary thought to think that the inner earth inhabitants teamed up with the Nazis. But that's, you know, it's kind of a common thread when you're talking about hollow earth. And it's what we discussed in our episode of it was there are so many different peoples throughout the world that have these ancient beliefs of people coming from an inner earth. The Hopi Indians just off the top, you know, believed in something similar and they had accounts of people emerging from these caves and emerging from these holes in the earth. So it, it's it's like we've said multiple times before, I think history kind of is told in these tales and there has to be some element of truth to these things that are being passed down through generations in these different cultures. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, um, you know, 
curiously, um, even Jules Verne, who Jules Verne was an initiate for sure. And in fact, the whole area around Renless Chateau is um, south of Carcassonne and the, the, the blood, Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, that whole story. He has characters in his books that are place names, important place names in that mystery, which is really odd. But in, in Journey to the Center of the Earth, what do they see? A mammoth. Mm-hmm. And that's what Bird reported as well. So, yeah. Re- and you know, why did John Kerry go there on, on the last day of Obama's presidency? Um, and why did Schwab uh, yeah. and um, a, a couple others recently say they were going, they tweeted, they're going to Antarctica. This will yeah. change everything, they said. We actually mentioned that briefly uh, recently. <laughs> we have. Interesting. Yeah. And, and what, you know, what, why can't you go there? Um, and who owns the property there? What, Rockefeller? So look at that, the UN map of the earth and, and tell me that the continents are all represented there, but beyond the continents are a lot more continents. Is that where the UFOs are coming from? And does the firmament just cover our portion of this rock or does it cover the whole thing? Mm, maybe it's like uh, two sides to the same coin type of thing. You know, they have a firmament on their end also. Yeah. You know, people should Google it. And every ancient religion talks about this waterly abyss that separates us from the waters beyond. And the moon and the sun are within the firmament inside. And you look at the sun, they... I can't remember how far is the sun supposed to be away, but look how the sun just has these really intense beams and an angle. And it would be impossible if it was actually that zillion trillions of light years away, but it's not impossible if it's inside our firmament. Mm, 93 million miles. 93 million miles. And you you feel it like it's going to burn your face off. And it's on these really pronounced angles. How does that work? And again, we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Really? I think, I think if you were to tell like a six-year-old, okay, we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour and we're going through uh, the solar system at this speed. I forget how fast that is. It's even more ridiculous. And we're round and there's water that's glued to the planet. Uh, but butterflies can fly around. That's no problem. They would go, no, none of that makes sense. We should start interviewing butterflies. <laughs> yeah, butterflies. <laughs> Tell the biggest lie you can think of as often as you can and uh, people will believe it. They call it broad casting for a reason never thought of that it, that happens a lot when you break down a lot of these words that are you know thrown at us every day it's all propaganda at the end of it all yeah i mean i, I think um whether whether we believe we're in the age of aquarius yet or not i'm really intrigued about what's coming i mean in the age of taurus earthlings worship the bull and in the age of aries they worship the ram and the age of pisces they worship the fish and now we're moving into aquarius which is water mm. yeah and that's always an interesting transmutation almost like an interesting energy shift that happens when you get into the age of Aquarius. And there's this, you know, so much is being revealed right now. And I, I think uh, I'll, I'll be careful about saying some things because I, I know how how strict we're censored right now if we talk about uh, the scamdemic. Um, <laughs> but people just need to go and see what Schwab and Obama and Gates and Fauci, just listen to what they say, read the books that they've written no one's tried to hide it. They've even called it the Great Reset. Um, and no one, oh, that's that's fine. Yeah, reset our world economy. That's okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. What? So I think there's this great battle uh, between good and evil. Uh, when I say evil, I mean real satanic cabal evil. Adrenochrome harvesting satanic cabal evil that includes off-world elements. And there's a battle going on. And I think he says optimistically, the good guys have just um, just about uh, won. I think you're going to see things trending very, very quickly, and not just because of the truckers, but you're going to see things trending the way they're trending now very fast. It's very reminiscent of something um, of all people. J. Edgar Hoover said, you know, he said that the, the individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous 
he can't believe it exists. Even though it is all in their face, a lot of people will still not believe it. And they'll come up with reasoning uh, in their own heads to to ignore it, I guess. Yeah. What's, what's the quote? They always attribute it to Mark Twain, but I don't think he said it. Um, it's, it's easier to uh, hoodwink somebody than it is to convince them they were hoodwinked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all really proud of our intelligence and ability to reason. And you're absolutely right. If, if, if something is that audacious, how could every single image we've seen of Earth be round? How can every media outlet in the world be lying to us? It's impossible. I mean, we use our rational minds to reject the fact that there is a network that we can't imagine. And it only takes a few people on top to dictate that there is, you know, a common script being disseminated around the world. You mentioned pyramids moments ago. I've heard there's some allegedly in Georgia that are very Mayan in appearance. Do you believe all of these pyramids to be connected globally? Yeah, the pyramids are so weird because I mean, there's one in Illinois, um, uh, Southern Illinois has got a pyramid. I mean, it's all in ruins, but there was a huge pyramid and an underground pyramid in uh, Alaska. We did a show on that and there was a a guy who, a military guy who was obsessed about the fact that around Mount McKinley, the the OS map is just sort of generic and and there doesn't show anything. It's just kind of blank. And he was researching that when he saw a, a television report that said, some seismic analysis had been done and had uncovered an underground pyramid right in that spot that he was kind of fixating on. So he, he couldn't believe his luck. He went to the TV station because he never saw it shown again. And they said, what program? Uh, hmm. um, and he eventually found someone to say, yeah, they did show it. And they were told never to show it again. And you've got the pyramid in Bosnia, loads in China. Um, they're, they're everywhere. But... Uh, you know, the ancient texts don't write about them. Why? 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 Yeah, that's interesting too, is when you look at the the history that we're told and how much it varies and differs from the actuality and the fact of it. Andrew, we have covered a lot of stuff in this. If you had just one little message to send out to our listeners, what would you say? Besides NASA lies, <laughs> um, I, would, I would say... Um, don't believe a word of it. Trust your intuition, do your own research, and you're going to be more accurate than than the, the history books that you've been, uh, you've been given. Very well spoken. Thank you, Andrew. We want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and just eye-opening. It's been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, thank you. I've enjoyed this. It's been my pleasure. Th- thanks, guys. Let's do it again. Just let everybody know where they can find you, uh, where they can look into the work that you've been doing, anything that you want to plug. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, I have no products. I don't sell <laughs> anything. Um, I probably should, but my website is andrewgoff.com, andrew, G-O-U-G-H.com. And uh, that's where all my articles and stuff are. So uh, please have a look. And oh, by the way, there's about 10 YouTube videos now coming out on, uh, that I've given on 10 of my 50 uh, history articles. So look for those on YouTube as well. Fantastic. Thank you again, Andrew. And thank you, Hushlings, for listening. And good night. Put your hands together for Slick Frank Sanders and the Molly Wap Band. <laughs> I'm gonna go get some more.